now a couple minutes after one. Um, so we're going to get started. Welcome everyone. Um, for those of you who don't yet know me, I am Suzanne Brinker, uh, a co-founder and the lead strategist at Div Higher Education. And with me here is Audra Delaney, um, our marketing manager. We are a full service marketing agency for colleges and universities in Boston. We specialize in websites, media, content, and email. And today we are here to talk about the future of higher ed and the future of higher ed marketing, which are two of my absolute favorite topics. So I was really excited to see registrations from such a diverse set of institutions. Um, it would be great if you could go to the chat and introduce yourself, tell us where you currently work and make sure that you're choosing to send your response to everyone and not just panelists and yourself so everyone can see your response. We've tried to jam pack our time together today with strategic and actionable insights that you can put to use at your institutions right away. So we'll look at the decade ahead. Um, we'll look at the priority audiences in the context of what institutions you might be working at. And then we'll, we'll talk about the nuts and bolts of higher ed marketing in the context of those trends and audiences. Um, please do engage in the chat throughout. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A discussion at the end. And if you'd like to um, tweet, or post on LinkedIn around any um, shareable insights that you are getting from the session. It would be awesome if you could use the hashtag VivHigherEd so that we can see your posts and others in the session can find them as well. Um, and that is V-I-V-H-I-E-D. To start, we have a pop quiz for you um, because we want to start with the question, what, what is higher ed marketing? Um, and to that end, we're going to ask actually two questions. What is higher ed marketing not? And what is higher ed marketing? We would love to just have a little bit of fun and have you respond to those questions in a poll. So what is higher ed marketing not? A way to increase brand awareness, a way to increase leads and applicants, or a magic fix. And then next, what is higher ed marketing? Order taking from faculty, a strategic partnership, or a guaranteed way to get enrollments? We'll give you a couple of seconds to cast your votes. And I am sure since you're all seasoned higher ed folks, you uh, will get this right, or maybe you'll give a sarcastic response, which is also fun. Um, but <laughs> we're gonna share the results. And of course, just to iterate, reiterate, what higher ed marketing is not, it is not order taking from faculty, right? We don't just blindly take orders from faculty or administrators for, um, marketing requests um, for programs that they want to get out there and blindly follow them. And it is also not a magic fix to long-standing enrollment problems that your institution may have. What actually is higher ed marketing? Well, it's a strategic partnership. We have to involve market research, program strategy, marketing strategy, admissions, recruitment, all the way through the mar to marketing execution in order to be successful. That is actually why um, higher ed marketers make great members of strategic planning committees. Um, but yeah, as marketers, we wear a lot of different hats. We have a lot of responsibility um, related to marketing, but we also sort of act like politicians in our complex and often siloed university environments. We need to influence faculty, administrators, admissions, enrollment, and student success teams to achieve value propositions that we know our audiences are looking for. This means we also play an important role in influencing our institutions for a more innovative and strategic future. So I have four claims for you this, I was gonna say this morning, this afternoon, um, at least here on the East Coast, about the future of higher ed. The first one is the current business model for degree programs is becoming more unsustainable requiring new revenue streams. And there's actually data to back this up. Many states are already seeing declines in high school seniors who are going to college or will in the next five to 10 years. So we have to innovate. And in really thinking about the student experience, we know we will be increasingly focusing on alternative credentials, corporate collaboration, virtual experiences, and hybrid classrooms. 
Claim number two, changing demographics are shaking up established enrollment pipelines, requiring that we serve new and more diverse audiences. And so as we consider these new and diverse audiences, how can we as higher ed marketers impact our institution's leadership in that area? And how can we authentically communicate this leadership to our prospects and applicants? Meanwhile, the data on how COVID has impacted attitudes about online learning is mixed, but we do know that students are expecting more hybrid experiences now that facilitate both flexibility and belonging. As marketers and higher ed marketers, we love a good win-win, and we also love opportunities to promote win-wins in our messaging and marketing materials. So let's help our institutions create more of them. And as our customer centricity in higher ed is increasing, how are we as marketers going to communicate a customer centric mindset in our institution's marketing materials? Claim number three, demands in the labor market are shifting, requiring new kinds of credentials. We already touched on this in the context of new revenue streams, but the changing realities of work will make it um, much more important for higher ed to focus on borderless education, shorter courses and degrees, more experiential learning, and a heavier emphasis also on lifelong learning. So how can we build pipelines for these new products while also still meeting our enrollment goals for traditional degree, degree programs? Fourth and final claim, scrutiny about the cost and value of a degree is increasing, requiring innovative leadership. In seeking to bring this innovative leadership to the table, how can higher ed marketers advocate for more transparency, affordability, and scholarships while simultaneously also still promoting programs with less than perfect cost value propositions? And as we think about the different ages, the age of manufacturing, the age of distribution, the age of information, the age of the customer, all the way to whatever age comes next, how can we position our institutions to help lead that change on a local, national, and global level? It's exciting stuff to think about and also maybe a bit scary. So these are all some really big ideas and questions, and we know college and, colleges and universities actually love to plan for the future. And I did say earlier that higher ed marketers make really good members of strategic planning committees, but I recently came across this post by someone in my LinkedIn profile network, um, and it definitely got me thinking. Um, and so we have another quick poll here for you. I'd love to know if you agree. Tell us in this quick poll, do you wish your institution spent a little less time planning and a little more time strategically executing their plans? And I know it rang true for me when I was thinking about my prior roles at universities, um, but is it the same for you? I would imagine that it is very depending on the institutional context and institutional type, but I'm super curious um, how you're going to vote on this one. I'll give you a couple of seconds. All right, I think we can end the poll and share the results. So it looks like, interesting, 75% of you agree that strategic planning is actually less important to success at this time than strategic implementation, and 25% of you disagree. And again, I would bet it heavily depends on institutional context and your experiences within it. Just as much um, as institutional context matters to this question, it also really matters to what audiences are a priority. For example, if you're working for a liberal arts college, your priority audience probably to a large extent is still domestic and international undergraduate students. If you work for a research university, you're probably also really focused on domestic and international graduate students. If you work for an institution that exclusively um, offers online programs or a division of an institution that exclusively focuses on them, you really care about working professionals. And if you work at a community college, more likely than not, first generation students with diverse backgrounds are really important to you at this time. 
But no matter who your audience is, of course, we need to ask, what do they need to reach their goals? How is your school going to help them get there? And how can that impact be communicated in your marketing campaigns? To that end, it's really important to start with program research and strategy. So another question for you, this one's not a poll, just put your answer in the chat. Are you and or your team currently involved in making decisions about which programs do and do not get launched um, and which programs do and do not get resourced with marketing? Either way, you know that it's really important to first determine if there is a favorable demand supply ratio, ensure that solid value propositions are in place and that there is demand in the labor market for a program or a credential before launching it and resourcing it with, with marketing budget and time. It's not enough, right, to just have a willing faculty member who is super eager to launch their next passion project waving their hands and volunteering um, for that to warrant a big marketing spend. Uh, and I bet we have all been there. So now we're moving on to our nuts and bolts section of the agenda, where I'll share some key insights from campaigns that we've managed, highlight important audience specific messaging that has performed well, and talk about how to position marketing campaigns for the future growth that your school is planning for. Um, on media, there are three main types of campaigns that we run. Um, and the important part about that is that they really all need to go hand in hand. They all have to have things that they do well and things that they don't do so well. For example, top of funnel campaigns on social and display do bring a lot of leads um, and a lot of lead volume, but those leads don't immediately typically convert to applicants or enrollments without some love and time going into them. Meanwhile, Lower funnel tactics like Google search and retargeting convert much better when it comes to applicants and enrollments, but they don't generate the same volume that social and display campaigns do, and that volume can be really, really important. And finally, SEO-infused organic content actually outperforms both of these paid tactics, but first of all, it's a little bit tricky to do it well, um, and the volume it generates is also lower than paid, and so because of that, we really want to be using all three together in the most strategic way possible. Moving on from media, here are three big items on campaign creative. So the first one is higher ed marketers are hurting for authentic, diverse, and immersive custom shot photography. It's often a really big problem at institutions. And then also, we do need to become more intentional about testing benefit-oriented copy against inspirational copy to see which performs better with our audiences. I'll tell you a little bit later about how we've done this, but what we found is that benefits-oriented copy works really, really well with grad students and working professionals, and that um, the inspirational copy works really well with high schoolers and also sometimes um, graduate students. So it's really important to test that. And then also we need three to five key value propositions that we know actually matter to our audiences that determine imagery and copy across all our campaign assets. So including ads, landing pages, emails, print materials, it needs to be consistent, right? So let's play a quick game. I have six higher ed ads here for you. Which of these is your favorite? Tell us in the chat. But maybe that's a bit of a trick question because there's so little differentiation in higher ed ads in general, it's, it's sometimes hard to pick, right? We see them, we get retargeted. If we do a lot of competitor research um, for institutions, we get retargeted on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Um, and we realize they're, they're all kind of looking the same these days. Um, but I do actually have two of these that stand out to me, Harvard and Syracuse. And the reason for that is that they're the only ones that articulate immediately a clear benefit. So Harvard is telling you that this program takes nine months to complete. Syracuse is telling you um, there's no GMAT required. So those are really helpful, right? They remove barriers or concerns for prospects. None of these ads are inspirational in their copy, which may be because that was tested and dismissed as not a good way to do it, but it's just interesting. And then some of these literally just say the school and what program they offer as if that's enough to make people want to learn more. 
To compare, here's um, some campaign creatives that we worked on for the Tufts School of Medicine and promoting their hybrid and accelerated doctor of physical therapy program. Their audience is both um, domestic undergraduate students in the health sciences and also domestic working professionals, um, no international because of accreditation. And we did not have the luxury for this campaign of working with custom photography, but the images we used are clinically accurate. They align with the value propositions we needed to highlight, including the immersive clinical sessions that the program offers and the hands-on faculty mentorship. And we also used a shot of the Boston skyline because the location is a big draw for their audience, looking for a hybrid learning experience with meaningful in-person components. And then we also promote a virtual open house to give prospects an option beyond, you know, the typical learn more and apply now, which could be either vague or kind of too big of an ask at that stage. And we want to get them in front of the admissions team really as quickly as possible. Here is another set of examples. This one is from a campaign we did for Tufts pre-college programs, which of course targets high school students. And this set of ads makes heavy use of inspirational copy, which we found is effective for high school students, as I already mentioned, um, when it might not be for professionals or grad students. Um, we used COVID-friendly imagery here because these ads were launched during the pandemic. And we're also promoting several programs in one campaign because high school students might be interested in one or more of them at the early inquiry stage. And finally, this is a campaign um, from Penn State where we had the luxury of doing a custom photo shoot, which really anytime we can do that, we should, to really hone in on the value propositions when marketing our online graduate program for portfolio to international students. So again, international audience, we're trying to get them to be interested in online offerings, which is quite different than attracting international students into a campus setting. But based on in-country focus groups that we conducted in Hong Kong, Korea, and um, three different cities in Turkey at, after we honed in on those markets, we knew that this audience most cared about prestige, tangible program outcomes and peer-to-peer -peer relationships. And so we put all of those components into the image. So we have the quintessential campus building in the background, which is Penn State's main administrative building. It's called Old Main. Um, we reinforce this prestige with um, the terms top ranked and academic excellence since 1855, which we message tested and they performed really well. And then the diverse group of peers, international students and domestic students together, you might imagine at graduation, maybe it's the first time they've actually set foot on campus after studying from their home, home countries. They're meeting their friends. Um, there is a nod to technology here as well. Um, but it was really, really important to the students that we talked to in Korea to see this kind of celebratory, achievement-oriented messaging. I'm always shocked how many online programs advertise with um, images of a single person sitting in a dark living room with their laptop. And the students told us in the focus groups, don't show me what it looks like to just be with my laptop on any given day. Show me what it's gonna look like once you change my life. And that's what we try to do here. Uh, another big question for you. Tell us in the chat, do you currently have a robust content strategy? Um, tactical examples of a content strategy include SEO infused blog posts, um, faculty led blog posts or how to videos, downloadable white papers, um, that type of thing. And chances are that if you answered no, that's not because you don't recognize the value of content marketing, but maybe you lack the bandwidth to do it. It's notoriously hard to do it well consistently. But it's necessary to do it, um, and now and not just for undergraduate or graduate degree programs, but especially also for the alternative credentials that we talked about earlier. Prospects for things like boot camps, workshops, or certificates, they're not used to thinking about colleges and universities for anything other than degrees, right? So we need to reel them in with content that addresses their pain points and goals. And we need to give the prospects time to actually warm up to the idea of taking an alternative credential at your institution. It's really not wise to launch a new credential, put it in the market, put some paid ads out there and assume that people are going to enroll just because it tends to be a lot cheaper than a degree. That's not how that works. Here is one example um, on content strategy from Northeastern where we actually managed a very well thought out and executed graduate blog. So every quarter we had two priority programs for which we wrote SEO infused blog posts. 
So let's say cybersecurity graduate degree was a priority one quarter. And we would then write a series of pieces like how to launch a cybersecurity career um, and provide really robust and engaging insights that initially had nothing to do with our brand or program. And then the Northeastern pitch was really subtle at the end where people could download a brochure about the program and we could capture them as leads. Here's another slightly different content offer that we worked on for the School of the Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston. We used authentic student photography and even some student artwork in the course catalog. And this one, this course catalog promotes their continuing education offerings. So again, non-degree. Um, and this is a versatile content offer that can actually be used in various places such as web pages, emails, um, and also as a lead magnet on blog posts. Yet another question for you, does your team tend to have designated landing pages for each campaign and for each distinct audience? Um, this is not only an important thing to do for tracking and to make the messaging as relevant as possible, but for lead capture as well. And did you know that removing the navigation menu can increase signups by 100%? That is definitely a fun fact. Um, we're currently putting together a landing page toolkit, which we'll add to our website when it's done in a few weeks. Um, but when it comes to landing pages, there's a lot to consider from tone to readability to privacy policies to crisp value propositions to button accessibility to lead form length all the way, excuse me, to imagery, financial info, testimonials, and thank you pages. And this sneak peek of the list that we're going to launch is actually not even exhaustive. Um, it just gives you an idea of all the pieces it's going to touch. But let's play another quick game, all in good fun and with no offense to the institutions in question. But what is the issue with this landing page? Um, I'm sure as seasoned marketers and higher ed marketers, you know, um, there are maybe multiple issues, but one big issue is that the apply now button is really getting lost in the red of the top banner. Um, you may also argue in addition to that, that the big inspirational copy alongside three parallel CTAs. So we have chat, right? We have request info, we have apply now would be really overwhelming to a user. So pick a priority action and make it really easy for that user to take it. Here's another, what's the issue here? And of course, it's the lead form. Um, there are way too many fields in this lead form. We need to focus on really just name and email address um, above all else. And if the page happens to be promoting multiple programs, um, an argument can be made. You know, we need to ask people what program they're interested in if they already know, so we can send them the most relevant info. But otherwise, less really is more here. And a third and final example. This one is surprisingly common. Um, the issue is that there is a total mismatch between the hero image and the headline. So the University of uh, Colorado at Boulder has a beautiful location, which is a big selling point for many of their prospects. And it may seem tempting, right, to communicate that through the image and then use the headline to communicate something else. So in this case, career advancement. But it's not a good idea to do that when people have such limited attention spans that they're just not going to think very hard about it. And we want them to lock in a clear and concise message that they will hopefully retain over time. So moving on from these examples, here's a page that we recently designed for a leadership workshop at Tufts, which is targeting working professionals from a variety of fields with a non-degree offer. So again, future forward kind of content and programming. A few things that work well here, if we do say so ourselves, is the headline copy is infused with, with SEO. Um, there is a high contrast CTA button. The lead form is short and to the point. And the visual elements further down the page focus on clean value props. Um, now, what's not pictured here actually are a couple of creative, creative content offers that we made. One, a live Q&A session with the faculty lead, which then ultimately, once that's done, you can use the recording, um, and a downloadable cost justification letter with prospects, uh, which prospects can use <clears throat> with their employers um, to justify the cost of attending and hopefully not have to pay it out of pocket. Here's another example. Um, this one um, is part of the same campaign we looked at earlier for Penn State's international online graduate programs. Um, 
This landing page is brief. The imagery is consistent to the ads. The headline and image work together. The rankings badge never hurts if you have the copyright to use it and you have rankings that you want to highlight. And finally, uh, the lead form is short and sweet as well. Speaking of leads, obviously, once we capture them, we have to nurture them. Um, for that, we need meaningful content. We need to be speedy. We need uh, to combine content that matches um, kind of short form and long form promotional and editorial approaches. And we should never be afraid to ask prospects questions rather than just talk at them about how great we are. So when we're using things like emails, texts, phone calls, events, we need to ask them questions about themselves. What are your goals? What are you hoping to get out of this? Shocking how few people do that. Shocking how many students respond. I actually recently had a great conversation with a really smart um, AVP of marketing at a small regional liberal arts college. And she told me they brought in their largest class ever this semester, despite COVID. Um, she attributed that to figuring out how to keep on-campus tours going during the pandemic. Um, a strategic approach to discount rate. And finally, the fact that they engage students in dialogue um, with admissions as early as possible by asking them questions through emails and texts. And I know a lot of higher ed marketers go back and forth on what type of emails perform the best, short and promotional ones or longer editorial ones. The answer is we really need both. Um, personalized content builds trust and urgency while um, the shorter form promotional content nudges people towards taking an action. And it's really important to do both of those things. So when we um, develop nurture campaigns and even um, you know, broadcast type emails for our clients, we always intentionally switch between inspiration content, editorial content, and promotional messaging knowing we are nurturing leads at different stages of their customer journey. And we need to make sure they are all receiving relevant content because otherwise they will tune us out. Finally, as with most things um, in higher ed marketing, an entrepreneurial mindset is really key. We want to arm ourselves with analytics like in-platform data, Google Analytics and tools like Tableau um, and then learn how to fail fast and optimize quickly. And there's also this big idea um, in higher ed right now around customer lifecycle management for which we need strong CRM solutions. But the idea is that in an ideal world, we would be able to engage higher ed audiences throughout their lives, right? From pre-college to undergrad, to grad, to professional development, all the way through learning and retirement. And in an even more ideal world, we would then do that with their kids as well. Um, few universities are on a solid path to figuring this out, but it all starts with strong CRM solutions um, so that we know what actions, you know, our audiences are taking. And especially in large university environments um, where those audiences are interacting with vastly different teams, CRM solutions help pull it all together. With that, that was quite enough from me. Um, I'd love to hear your questions um, and talk a little bit more with you. So Audra, um, do we have any questions that have come in either through the chat or through the Q&A? Uh, yes, we, we do have one question and this goes back to um, when we were talking about landing page lead form. Um, so this person is wondering, uh, you know, what do we consider to be um, a good percentage of people who've filled out a lead form and also asked um, what percentage of the visitors on our specific um, Tufts page filled out the form? Mm, yeah, I don't have that, those statistics. We can get back to you about that specific page. I should have pulled that before. Um, in terms of how many people convert, I mean, it really depends on um, the campaign, but if we can get 10% of our uh, traffic to convert to a lead, that's a big success for us. And um, that's the metric that we've used across different campaigns where we kind of gauge success and say, you know, is this working or is it not? But then of course we also look at the leads, like who are they and are they quality leads? What do they do once they get there is um, just as important or even more important when we, when we evaluate the success because sometimes there can be a mismatch in the targeting on the media side. Um, we're, we're just not reaching the right people and we have to think a little bit differently about um, who we're bringing into the door. 
Awesome. And I know that we had um, some folks who um, really wanted to be here today, but could not. So we have some questions from them. Um, one of which is, you know, we uh, we talked about, um, you know, earlier in the slides, how higher ed institutions have um, ads that are all very similar. And so um, could you talk a little bit about very quick win or easy ways people could try to differentiate even the way that their ads look along with the content that they put on those ads? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that's where the um, authentic, you know, immersive, diverse photography can really help because you have the ability to really communicate your unique selling points um, in an authentic way. It's not just here's who we wish we were, but it's here's who we actually are. And pairing that imagery with um, really clear and concise value propositions that you actually know are different. So, you know, if you have more star times than your competition, we need to know that. If you like um, Syracuse, you know, you don't expect a GMAT and everybody else does, you want to say that. Um, but if nobody does, then maybe that's not what to, what to use. Um, and we've also seen testimonial-based ad creative um, being really strong. Um, so having kind of student testimonials at the center or putting not faculty testimonials, but putting your faculty members also at the center, if you know, especially on the graduate side, that students really care about who they're going to be working with and whose mentorship they're going to be receiving. Um, if your faculty members are game, right, like having a, a, a live Q&A, putting their face on the ad that promotes that live Q&A is a really good idea as well. And how do you think that all carries over um, in email strategies too? I think a lot of the things you just said could be applied there, but are there any other specific quick wins that, you know, could be really useful um, for folks' email strategies? Yeah, on email, it's similar. You just have more space to make your point. And you really, um, I think I said this earlier, want to make sure that the messages are consistent across your ads, um, your organic content, uh, like blog posts, and then um, all the way through your landing pages and into your emails. And I'm not suggesting always, you know, kind of repeating the same exact language, but to make sure that you have three to five points that you're making and you're making them consistently. Um, and in, in emails, you really do have the opportunity to ask questions though. So I think oftentimes emails read in a really promotional manner. Um, where it's just like, let us tell you about how awesome we are, and here are our rankings, and here's our faculty, and here's our campus, and this and that, you know, and that that all has its place, but um, really trying to get students to actually respond um, is, a, is a different tactic that, that you would use on email that you wouldn't necessarily use in an ad, for example. Um, and then, like I said before, not always being promotional and having kind of thought leadership and editorial content to mix in there, having urgency in your emails where you're leading with, you know, application deadlines, last chance to register for this free Q&A with the faculty, that really helps boost open rates when the more meaty content is really where you're going to get your click through rates up. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and we've talked a lot in this session, particularly about digital tactics. And I think that maybe if you could speak a little bit to the, some traditional media tactics that mm -hmm. um, very many institutions like still have to use and the best way to include those in your overall marketing mix. Yeah, thank you. That's such a good question. And we didn't really have many print examples in this presentation, although we, we probably could have added some. So um, first of all, print is still a way to break through the noise. Um, where everything has gone so heavily digital. And of course, the pandemic was um, an opportunity and also potentially a barrier to that, depending on what print materials we're talking about. Like working professionals, they're not going to be at their desks during the pandemic, right? But high school students and their parents are going to be at home a lot. So sending a postcard is probably a really good idea if you don't do that already, or sending more postcards this year. Um, if you can afford um, making a really nice catalog or brochure that you mail to people, um, if you don't already, that's also a good idea. But actually, the thing I'm most passionate about talking about right now is um, the billboard piece, because um, a lot of um, higher ed marketers say, hey, we can do these digital billboards, you know, let's figure out where to put them, let's put creative up. And we actually have data that shows that the static billboards on public transportation and elsewhere are much more effective. They perform way better than digital. And so that's an area where if you're currently really leaning heavily on the digital side, I would recommend um, exploring some static billboards for sure and aligning the placement heavily with where kind of the bulk of your students are coming from. So 
um, we know with you know a pre-college program that we work with that there is kind of a suburban area where most of their students are coming from. So putting you know static billboards on the train stops from the suburbs into the city where parents and students might see them is a really good play versus putting them somewhere where they're not going to be spending quite as much time. Awesome. And uh, we have a, another question that circles back um, to landing pages. So this question is that um, if 90% of landing page visitors do not complete the form, um, even on a really excellent page, you know, why do we think that is? And what may be missing in the prospect's mind that makes them hesitate to inquire? Um, and how do you better appeal to that audience ultimately? Such a good question, right. So we were trying to really hone in on the please request information. We make it really easy for prospects to do that, but people are wary of doing it because they know they're giving you their email and you're gonna start emailing them and then they have to go through the trouble of potentially unsubscribing. They don't wanna do that. And um, they're also sometimes frustrated. And that's why we've taken a slightly different approach with our landing pages. If all you're telling them to do is request information, without giving them really anything substantial, that's gonna be a frustrating experience for them. And we actually, for that reason, shy away from um, in-platform lead forms, like on Facebook, where you're not even taking them to a landing page, you're just asking them for their email right away. People comment on those and they say, how dare you ask me for my email? You know, you need to give me some information first. So number one, um, we try to add some kind of, not very central, but kind of further down the page, some content offers that are also lead magnets, like download justification letter for your employer, register for a live Q&A. Those things are much more concrete in a prospect's mind and they can say, okay, I see how it's useful to give my email address to you now. But then <clears throat> retargeting is another way to capture them later, of course. And so it's really important for that exact reason to have um, separate landing pages for each campaign, you know, knowing who the audiences are that come to your landing pages, having pixels in place that allow you to retarget them, and then measuring the success of that so people don't forget about you. Awesome. I think that is all of the questions that we have from the audience today. Very cool. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure um, to have you here today. Uh, we did record the ses session. We will send you a recording via email very soon. Um, and if you're interested in reaching out, um, you can reach me at Suzanne at vivwebs.com. I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and if you're interested in setting up some time to talk about your marketing goals, brainstorm some quick wins together, um, I would absolutely love that. So. With that, and thank you, Audra, um, for managing the chat and Q&A, super helpful. And um, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. It's been really great having you here. Yes, and just to add, we are gonna uh, send out the recording, um, which will include all of the slides um, that Suzanne has presented here today. I, I see that some of you are asking about that. So you will be able to have access to those. Excellent, that's awesome. Well, thank you again, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.